Recently we got the announcement of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, the next main series Pokemon game said to be a remake of Diamond and Pearl. Though I suspect remake is going to look more like reskin, which is, you know, taking a 15 year old game and updating it for the modern era. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have a problem with this, but maybe as somebody who has grown up with Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, I think these games have issues that I would really like to see addressed and resolved in a true remake. So rather than just voicing my complaints on Twitter and expecting somebody else to solve the problem, I'm going to do my best to address the issues I see with Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum and try and provide a solution that helps correct some of these issues. In other words, I'm going to fix Sinnoh! Please be gentle in the comments. Okay, so what are the main issues with the Sinnoh games? Well, there's a lot, but there are six in particular worth addressing in this video. One, the pacing of major battles. By these I define major battles as any encounters with either Team Galactic or Gym Leaders. Now due to poor pacing, a lot of the Team Galactic encounters and Gym Leaders run together, especially in the back half of the game. Contrasted with the fewer than 10 Badge and Galactic battles in the first half of the game, the back half has more than double the amount of story-related battles, most of which are crammed between badges 6 and 8. To the distribution of available Pokemon. In the areas available before Badge 2 in Eterna City, there are 33 available wild Pokemon. When you factor in their evolutions, this accounts for around half of the Diamond and Pearl Pokedex. This creates a problem not only before Eterna City, but also far after. In the route surrounding Jubilife City, it feels like they just copied and pasted the encounter tables. And even once you get later in the game, routes like 216, 217, and Lake Acuity have the exact same encounter tables. What this creates is a feeling of sameness when replaying Sinnoh. And while this is something present in almost every other Pokemon game, in particular the Kanto games, I feel the Sinnoh games suffer a lot from this sameness feeling. 3. Overabundance of Roadblocks Needing 6 HMs to complete the game is already a huge ask, but throwing in random roadblocks such as the Bike Shop Hostage Crisis, the Sunny Shore Blackout, and the side of doing... I can't even remember. These roadblocks just inhibit the pace way too much and make the games feel so much more restrictive than any other Pokemon game. And while the other two HMs aren't strictly necessary, it's certainly a pain in the rear to go through North Route 210 without defog, or go through the game without fly due to... four absurd amounts of backtracking. In order to complete the game, Diamond and Pearl require 21 uses of backtracking, which is absolutely ridiculous. Platinum isn't much better. While it removes some of the backtracking around the middle of the game, it randomly decides to send you to Twin Leaf Town after the Distortion World, when you are literally right next to Sunny Shore City! 13 of the required backtracks in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum require going back through the route you just went through. 5. Several routes and towns with no purpose whatsoever. Routes 209, Salation Town, Lost Tower, Lower Route 206, Wayward Cave, Fuego Ironworks, Route 212, 219, 220, 221, why do they exist? You can make an argument that they are optional areas to explore later, but often they feel pointless and that you lose nothing by removing them. They either are wasted space or missed opportunities. Wayward Cave and Fuego Ironworks suffer a lot due to you requiring to go out of your way to get an HM to visit them and more than likely have to backtrack. 6. Lack of setup and payoff. In storytelling, there's a well-known principle called Chekhov's gun. It says if you draw attention to something, for example a gun in the background of Act 1, in Act 2 you must fire it. Otherwise, don't draw attention to the gun in the first place. The basic principle is that in any story, 
the events must be used to either move the plot forward, develop character, or both. And Team Galactic suffers a serious lack of setup and payoff, which is why many people, myself included, aren't huge fans of them. Within the first three interactions with Team Galactic, we should know either A, who are the kind of people in Team Galactic, B, what Team Galactic's goals are, or C, preferably both. The problem is, the game doesn't use these first three interactions to set up any of them. So the story around Team Galactic at best doesn't follow this principle of Chekhov's gun, and at worst actively ignores it. Only the Valley Windworks energy plotline can tie into the end of the game, and that's only through five degrees of separation using the energy to make the bomb, to summon the Lake Trio, to make the Red Chain, to summon Dialga and Palvia, and make the New World. Which is a bit convoluted and a bit much to ask for any player to keep track of. Compare this to Black and White, where every interaction at the beginning of the game sets up either N's character, the goal of liberating Pokemon, or the secret desire for world domination. X and Y does an excellent job of setting up Lysander and his running theme of beauty, and by the time you get to the end of the game, you understand his desire to cleanse the world in order to maintain beauty. And Team Galactic just doesn't get this same level of care. Now these aren't just issues with Diamond and Pearl. In fact, I think Platinum actually exacerbates some of these issues. While Platinum does add 60 new Pokémon to the Pokédex, they are distributed poorly, with most of the new cast only accessible after obtaining the third badge. When you factor in the inexplicable removal of version-exclusives Murkrow and Mischievous from the Eterna Forest, there are actually fewer Pokémon available before the second badge, and only three new evolutionary lines are in Platinum before Badge 3, those being Gligar, Eevee, and Ralts. Ralts is the only one of those three you don't have to go out of your way to obtain. This means that until Heart Home City, the game is nearly identical to Diamond and Pearl, which I don't think is something good in a remake. Which is what Platinum is. Compare this to Black and White 2, which spices up the early route encounters from the original games, Lillipop, Patrap, Purloin, by adding in Sawaddle, Marit, Pidove, Ryoyu, Sunkern, and Azuril to routes 20 and Flockacy Ranch creating entirely different teams for someone to use, even before the first gym. So now that I've spent a good five minutes complaining about Sinnoh, how am I going to fix this? First, I want to set a few ground rules for myself. What can and can't I change? I can't add any Pokémon to the Pokédex beyond those that were already in Platinum. I can't change the locations of the gyms. I can't change the terrain and layout of the routes. I can't make major team changes to any specific NPC, and I can't access the island that's typically in the post-game. What can I change? I can change the encounter tables for where Pokémon are found in the region. I can change the order of the gyms. I can change when Team Galactic is battled, as well as different story events occurring. I can change the location of quality of life NPCs such as the Bike Shop and Underground Man. I can add teams for existing characters that don't have them. I can beef up the roles of characters that didn't have much to do in the originals. Finally, I can add or take away events in the story as I see fit, in particular with regards to Team Galactic. Now that all that's out of the way, let's get on to the actual changes. So the game starts out pretty much the same. Start in Twinleaf Town, get your starter Pokémon, go to Sandgem Town, head up Route 202 to Jubilife City. The only major change is that I'm ditching the two required instances of backtracking between Sandgem and Twinleaf Town. Now that we're in Jubilife City, this is the first of many major changes to the Team Galactic storyline. Instead of fighting Team Galactic for the first time when leaving Jubilife City for Eterna City, the double battle will instead happen when leaving for Orberg City. This establishes them as a credible threat earlier in the game, and gives Looker a more justified reason to be in Jubilife. As far as adjusting the difficulty, if the Clamio doesn't have Fake Out, this battle shouldn't be that difficult. It's not like Geodude is gonna make much of a difference here. This change also bumps the rival battle back a little bit, but more on that in just a second. From here, the progression is nearly identical to the originals. 
Route 204 to the Orberg Gate to Orberg City itself. As far as major changes go, at night, Duskull and Ghastly, as well as their respective evolutions, will be available at night on most of the routes from this point forward, possibly as version exclusives. Uh, I haven't really decided on that one yet. There are several reasons for this, but my main intention is to spice up the encounters available. The other main change is that the second fight against Barry happens closer to the gym, either before the gym battle, or probably my preference would be on your way out of Orberg City. Regardless, the fight against Rourke stays basically the same. The final change to Orberg itself is that I'm moving the Underground Man from Eternicity to Orberg City. I really don't get why he's in Eternicity to begin with, and it gives earlier access to fossil Pokémon, which is always appreciated in my book. So now we get to the single largest change of the game. Instead of going from Orberg to Eternicity, requiring backtracking to Jubilife, a difficult paddle against Mars, and a whole lot of nothing, we're gonna go straight from Orberg onto Route 207, through Mount Coronet, onto Route 208, and into Hardhome City. This turns the entirety of Route 206 into an optional area with the cycling road accessible later in the game. This does mean there needs to be a different exit obstacle than the mudslide out of Orberg, but Barry or the Underground Man could easily fulfill that role. So why this major change? Well, by making this change, we eliminate 8 of the 21 required backtracks in the story. On a design and difficulty standpoint, this change also can make a ton of sense. If we move Houndour, Murkrow, and Mischievous to be encounters somewhere on Lower 206, Coronet, Wayward Cave, and or 208, then suddenly we turn Fantina from one of the toughest gym leaders into one that's much easier. I say change her Haunter to a Drifloon, and you're good to go. Between these changes to the encounter table, the buff to knock off the base power making Gligar a viable option, as well as access to Duskull and or Ghastly, Suddenly, there are actual tools to beat Fantina Rith, rather than just hoping her Miss Magius won't absolutely destroy your team. N no, I'm not salty. It's not like I've lost half my team to her before in a Nuzlocke. As far as changes to the Team Galactic storyline, I say have the player in Barry chase down a Galactic Grunt to Mount Coronet, where there's a battle between said Grunt and Cyrus. This could turn Route 207 into a bit of a double battle gauntlet, which could be kind of fun. Also, Cyrus wouldn't be that difficult if you just give him a low-level Sneasel and Murkrow, both of which have pretty bad early movesets. I know this is super unconventional to battle the villainous leader this early, but similar to N, this battle helps build the relationship between the player and Cyrus, allows for a better exploration of his motives, and better sets up Mount Coronet's importance to the story. It also gives Barry more of a presence in this story, similar to that of Hugh or Bianca from the Unova games. And as a bonus, we get another opportunity to hear the awesome Cyrus theme. Everybody wins! Except Cyrus. Oh, and uh, I guess put the bike shop in heart home. I don't really have a better place for it in the game, and I actually completely forgot about the bike shop until I was finished with the first draft of the script. Anyways, now that we have badge 2, more major changes are coming. Instead of going onto Route 209 to Veilstone City, we're going to hop onto Route 212 instead. Here we add some of the Great Marsh encounters to the lower part of the route, such as Tangela, Yanma, and Tropius. Here comes another major change to the story, and this one I'm stealing from Renegade Platinum. Team Galactic overtaking the Pokémon Mansion. My thought here is that maybe they can try and take Mr. Backlot hostage for information about legendary Pokémon, in particular the Lake Trio? I don't know all the answers here. This would be the first encounter with one of the four galactic commanders, probably Mars taking the place of the Valley Windworks encounter. This also means that Perugly isn't a cheap and unfair fight anymore because you actually have resources to deal with it. Is it difficult? Yes, but now it's not just because you're fighting a Pokemon that's half the level it needs to be to evolve and is going to outspeed and crit everything. No, I'm not salty. It's not like I've lost over half my team to her before in a Nuzlocke. A different Nuzlocke. Anyways, we can also have Professor Rowan show up here to discuss the legendary Pokemon or something, anything to beef up his role. I genuinely forget Rowan as a character in these games. Last change at the Pokemon Mansion, 
we have Pokemon like Elekid, Magby, Swinub, and Cleffa appear in the Trophy Garden. This gives a trade-off for not having access to Rotom via Electabuzz, trading off an Electric type, and now you have access to every available Fire type. As Team Galactic leaves, you overhear word about the Galactic Bomb, similar to the plot point in the original games. However, now there's credibility to this threat since Team Galactic has been established as an organization that would do this rather than trying to steal honey when it costs less than a Pokeball. Once we get to Pistoria City, the same beats are going to play out as in the originals. The battle against Barry, the fight against Wake winning Badge 3, and the Galactic Bomb detonating. Though we're going to eliminate some backtracking here real quick. Rather than the bomb detonating in the Great Marsh as a trial, it will instead detonate at Lake Valor proper this time. This does mean that the Lake Trio can't have that same harmony link where they all rush to the aid of the other. Wait... I think that's a show exclusive thing. Uh, whoops. Regardless, the change of detonating the bomb now rather than after Badge 6 like in the originals benefits Team Galactic in two major ways. The first is Team Galactic feels more threatening now because they're actually taking action. And two, they get an actual inciting incident to help kick the plot into high gear, unlike in the originals. This is also where we'd likely have our first battle against Jupiter. After this, we head up to Veilstone City, face Maylene, win Badge 3, and then we get Lucas and Dawn talking about something to do with Team Galactic, similar to him or her dropping the Pokedex incident from the originals. Except less stupid. Now instead of doing the Veilstone Galactic HQ raid after the 7th gym badge, we do a smaller scale raid here. Since we've spread so many major battles more evenly throughout the story, we don't need a large scale raid on the Galactic HQ. The raid also allows for a bunch more double battles, giving Lucas or Don the opportunity to be slightly more memorable and a confrontation at the end with the last two galactic commanders, Saturn and Charon. Charon? Charon? I don't know. Another change that's a bit gutsy to do, but certainly possible nonetheless, instead of just hearing that they did horrible experiments to the Lake Trio like in the original games, we could actually see some of the, um, um, spectacle. And by making Saturn into a double battle, this allows him to not be a total pushover. Charon also gets the opportunity to be slightly more memorable in this version, with a team for him I envision something like Rotom, Golbat, and Porygon 2. Not the most difficult team, but certainly an interesting one. After this, we head up to Celestic Town, and it plays nearly identical to Platinum, with Cynthia asking us to give her grandma a necklace, a battle against Cyrus, this time him using Hodge, Crow, Houndoom, and Weavile, as well as getting more information about the Lake Trio, the Sinnoh creation, and whatever else Cynthia and her grandmother want to tell us. The scene ends with both Cyrus alluding to Team Galactic going up to Lake Acuity, and Cynthia talking about wanting to explore the Snowpoint Temple. Here we make another major change from the original, heading to Snowpoint City now, rather than later in the story. Snowpoint has a greater sense of urgency due to two major characters both heading there, so there is a natural flow to our story to go there now. Route 216 and 217 progress the same as before, and some similar roadblock to Lake Acuity until after we meet the gym. One aspect of this trek I think would be kinda cool is if we were leapfrogging Maylene. In Platinum, she heads up to Snowpoint at the same time as the player, so it could be kind of cool to have some extra battles with her, perhaps just Lucario or other Pokemon she wants to train, or even have her team up with the player against Cyrus in Celestic Town. We'd have to give another grunt to Cyrus, but it would be really cool to fight alongside a gym leader. What else can I say? Maylene is my favorite gym leader in the Pokemon franchise, and I would love to see her role in the story get beefed up more. Is it necessary? Admittedly, no, but it would be cool. Anyways, once in Snowpoint City, we check out the Snowpoint Temple with Cynthia. She can talk about Regigigas and more Sinnoh Creation Myth stuff, and perhaps we can steal again from Renegade Platinum and have a battle against the Snowpoint Temple Guards. I also think it's a good place to meet Candace, giving her a small role outside the gym that still ties into a random focus on... the focusing. I'm trying, y'all. Cut me some slack. 
I want to beef up the involvement of the gym leaders a little, so I'm giving some extra padding to gym leaders that didn't get a lot of outside interactions. After the Snowpoint Temple, we battle Candace. Now this may seem at first like we are making Candace significantly tougher by bumping her up to 5th gym leader instead of 7th, but we actually have almost all the same resources as we would in the original games. The only differences from Platinum are we don't have Scizor and Steelix due to the lack of Metal Coat, and a lack of Lucario since we don't have Riley to give us the Riolu egg yet. And considering that most people typically aren't playing with one of these three, I think this is a totally fair change to make. That said, if we're really concerned about difficulty, just remove Pile of Swine. Once the gym battle against Candace finishes, we have a similar scene from the original playout at Lake Acuity, where we see Jupiter beat the snot out of Barry, capture Yuxi, and her allude to something big happening in Eterna City this time, rather than Veilstone. I also see potential for her to detonate the Galactic Bomb, keeping that as a thread running throughout the story. From here we have our first instance of real backtracking in the game, since I don't have a better way to get us to Eterna City. Here the Eterna City Galactic Building takes another sizable chunk of the Veilstone Galactic Takeover with a battle against either Mars or Saturn at the end. Jupiter won't be there because... um... and I don't like her. Unlike taking the stupid bike shop guy hostage, we can have someone more serious such as Rowan or Gardenia as a hostage, my preference being for the former. Gardenia could also request help taking down the Galactic Building, perhaps because they're throwing a bunch of toxic waste in the forest. I don't, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm trying. Once the Galactic Takeover is finished, we battle Gardenia, and for the first time, like, ever, a Grass-type gym can actually be kind of tough, with her using Pokemon like Torterra, Leafeon, Tangrowth, in addition to her signature Rose Raid. Torterra and Tangrowth get access to Rock Slide, which makes the gym not a total pushover, like in the originals. After earning our 6 badge, things get a bit wonky. I'm not completely sold on which of the three locations here are the most necessary between Fuego Ironworks, Valley Windworks, and or Iron Island. Regardless, I say pick at least two of the three and have battles against some of the other galactic commanders, namely Charon and whoever's left between Mars or Saturn. Perhaps all three locations could be used in some way, not completely sure how to make it work, Maybe exploring Iron Islands gives more clues to the creation myth, or an event where we see Cyrus take the adamant lustrous of Grisius, or akin to Maxi and Archie taking the rubes and ruby sapphire and emerald. Regardless, the flow would be from Eternity to Floraroma Town to Cantalave City with a possible pit stop near Iron Island. Once in Cantalave, we fight Barry and Byron just like in the originals. After this gym battle, we have another similar beat to the originals with a galactic bomb detonating, this time at Lake Barry. We fast travel there so we don't have to backtrack as much, see Jupiter beat up Lucas or Dawn, and then form up a group with Professor Rowan along with Cynthia, Lucas, or Dawn, Barry, and Looker. Ah oh, shoot, I forgot to talk about Looker. Anyways, the group decides that Barry, Lucas, and Rowan will go to Veilstone City to free the Lake Trio, and the other trainers, that being you, Cynthia, and Looker, will all go to Storm Mount Coronet mostly thanks to a comment made by Jupiter as she leaves. This marks the third instance of backtracking in this version, but again there's a strong case to just fast travel to Orberg, lessening the need for true backtracking. Once there we go ahead and storm Mount Cornet, and the same story beats play out as we fight Team Galactic all the way to the summit. One change I will make is switching the two idiot grunts guarding the entrance to Spear Pillar to instead be Charon and Saturn. This will make for an absolutely brutal gauntlet where you fight all five galactic leaders right in a row, but come on people, you can't just expect half the galactic leadership to sit at the end of the world, and Barry would likely arrive just in the nick of time to help out with the double battles. Cyrus reveals the red chain, summons Dialga and or Palkia or Giratina, the lake trio intervenes to the surprise of everybody. We see Rowan and Lucas or Dawn rejoin the party, giving them both some actual use in the climax of the story. I admit this isn't the greatest way to solve the story thread because there's no actual input from the player here, but I can't think of anything better for the life of me, and frankly, it's still better than what's in the originals. As far as resolving the conflict with Cyrus, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not completely sure.
My vote is to have Cynthia absolutely wreck Dialga and or Palkia or Giratina with her Garcha. Not only would this help Cynthia as a character by showing she is a true bona fide threat to those who've lived under a rock the last 15 years, but it would also give her some actual use in the story, and most of all, it would be an accurate representation of me fighting Cynthia in 2006, my first time playing through Diamond. Is it a cop-out deus ex machina? Yeah. Do I care? No. With Team Galactic now defeated, it's time to return the Lake Spirits. The player along with Looker will go to Lake Valor to return Azel, but also to eliminate the need to completely backtrack to that area, unlike a certain other game. This marks the fourth and final instance of backtracking in this game. From here, things play out similar to the originals. You arrive in Sunny Shore, Flint asks for help to reignite the light in his bro, Volkner. One change I'm going to make is having it be revealed that Galactic Grunt Remnants are the cause of the Sunny Shore Blackout, similar to the machine part conflict in the Johto games with Team Rocket. The player and Volkner can team up to defeat them, and this provides a nice de-escalation of the conflict rather than everything ending abruptly at Spear Pillar. And it would give Volkner an opportunity to truly see the player as someone potentially worthy of challenging his gym, and from there the same beats play out. You defeat Volkner, all that's left is the last route, Victory Road, with hopefully 100% fewer HMs, training up the last rival battle and the Pokemon League. I don't really have great ideas for where to fit the various Elite Four members into the story, so they remain about as underdeveloped as ever. Cynthia still remains bloody difficult, with actual build-up to the fight now against her, and everyone gets to sweat in fear of the chomp after watching it demolish a couple of legendaries. And given 20 or 30 attempts, you defeat Cynthia and become champion. So let's review. We took 21 instances of required backtracking down to 4, all of which occur after getting access to fly, and only one of which requires going down a route you just came. The others have some amount of fast tracking to help with the progress. I'll admit this does make the story overall a bit more linear, but with plenty of optional areas along the way, I don't think this is going to be a huge issue. It's a similar linearity to the Hoenn games, and most people don't seem to have a problem with how those are paced prior to the water routes. We managed to beef up the difficulty of Team Galactic on the whole, and Gardenia while knocking down the random steep difficulty spikes of Fantina and Mars, without making the battles seem unfair or cheap because you don't have the proper resources. Many of the pointless places I talked about before are either made more important, such as Route 212 and potentially the Fuego Ironworks, or made completely optional, such as Route 209, Lost Tower, Salation Town, Route 206, and Wayward Cape. And instead of the optional stuff being there just to fill in the game, they now get to act as areas to explore at one's leisure. And with only a handful of additions to various encounter tables at the start of the game, we get the potential for completely different teams. Finally, we get to add and expand characters such as Rowan, Cynthia, and Cyrus, creating a more compelling picture for all of them. Now, um, bad news, I have absolutely no experience with ROM hacking or anything like that, so I can't exactly do a mock-up of the game. That said, if somebody with that experience wanted to do a mock-up, I'd be forever grateful. Please? Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video, please show your support and leave a like. What did you think of this Sinnoh redesign? What would you change about the Sinnoh region? Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.